Howdy, and welcome to Texas A&M's Virtual Earth Month. Uh, my name is Ben Kelcher. I'm the Sustainability Assistant Manager here at Texas A&M. Uh, happy to have you here with us today. Have a really exciting uh, topic. We're going to be learning about uh, cultures, cultural sustainability. Uh, it's an area that we don't often hear discussed, so we're definitely really excited to learn more about that topic today. Before we get started, I just wanted to uh, let you know some tips uh, that will make your viewing experience more enjoyable. Uh, so first, just put your computer into side-by-side -side mode. You could use uh, speaker view if you only want to see the person speaking on your screen or, or gallery if you want to see everyone who has their camera on. Um, that way you can see uh, the speaker and you can see uh, the PowerPoint presentation. I've also enabled live transcripts. So if you prefer to watch with subtitles, you have that option. You can turn the feature on or off in your toolbar. We also ask that during the course of this presentation that you please ask questions. You know, the more questions we have, the more exciting the Q&A is going to be at the end. Um, and also at that time, you could also turn your camera on and you could ask questions that way as well. I do want to let you know that we are recording this. We will have we will uh, post this on our YouTube page. So if you're uncomfortable with yourself being recorded, um, please don't um, you know uh, have yourself shown uh, at the end. But anything you put in the chat will not be available in the recording. So please participate participate fully. Uh, next up, I just want to let you know that you can be here uh, to win prizes. That may be one of the reasons that you're here. Hopefully you want to see some great content and learn a lot about sustainability, but prizes are cool too. Uh, so the way that it works is you earn points for completing different things uh, during Virtual Earth Month. And uh, one of the ways you earn points is by collecting code words when you watch these live virtual events. Uh, so code words, uh, one code word equals one point, and then you're able to redeem that point for an entry into our random draw giveaway. So what that means is the more points you get or the more code words you get, uh, the more entries you get into the drawing. So it just increases your odds of winning. Um, and code words will be written on a PowerPoint slide. They'll be spoken or they will be written in the chat. And what we want you to do is track your code words, attend all of the virtual Earth Month events that you possibly can. If you can't view live, watch the recording. Once you have all the code words collected, send them all in just one email to sustainability at tamu.edu at the conclusion of our events. Uh, all events conclude next Friday, and uh, you will have until April 30th to uh, watch recordings and, and get, in, get in your code words to our email. Um, so please do that. And also, uh, when you watch live, you get way more code words. You can get up to seven code words when you watch live. You watch the recording, you only have a chance to get one. So definitely watch live. And uh, also, we just want to let you know, you can even earn cash through Maroon Base. So Maroon Base is through the School of Innovation. Um, they have a series of, uh, well, basically, they have lots of different events, not just Virtual Earth Month. And what the way that it works is for all the events you attend, you get points. And at the end of every semester, they do drawings. I think they have more drawing than just uh, at the end of every semester, but you can win up to $2,000 in cash from room, room base. So lots of reasons you should be participating. And you can see all the rules here. It's also on our webpage. So check that out if you need to see more. I'll also post it in the chat later. Um, and just to let you know what the prizes are, you could win a Nintendo Switch. You could get fitness watches like an Apple Watch. Uh, you could get AirPods, like different wireless headphones. You could even get some Yeti coolers. And you can win a GoPro Hero 7. And also we have t-shirts and water bottles that you can earn that won't be part of the drawing that you just earn those by attending different events. And what you see here is you actually get to make a choice. If you're the grand prize winner, you can choose from any of the prizes and the runner ups get to choose from everything besides the Nintendo Switch. You just get one option, but that way, you know, if you have an Apple product, you get the AirPods. If you have something else, you get a different uh, headphone. Um, so with that, I want to turn it over to Kathia and Nikki, uh, they're interns in the Office of Sustainability. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and they are going to teach us about cultural sustainability. So whenever you uh, ladies are ready, thank you. Hi, I'm going to share my screen. I'm going to start. Okay. Howdy, my name is Katia Rivas, and I am a senior applied math major from McAllen, Texas, and I'm also an intern at the Office of Sustainability, and I'm here today with my partner, Nikki. Hi, everybody. My name is Nikki. I'm a senior in chemical engineering from Austin, Texas, and I'm also an intern at the Office of Sustainability. And today we're going to present social sustainability, how cultures influence each other. So in this presentation, we're first going to define 
sustainability and social sustainability. Then we're gonna talk about the relationship between culture and sustainability. And with that, we're gonna give some examples about different sustainability practices within different countries and cultures. And finally, we're going to talk about cultural appropriation and how that hinders sustainability. So first, we're going to talk about sustainability. Sustainability has three pillars, society, environment, and economy. The society pillar focuses more on people, um, respecting cultural values and morals, making sure everybody is included and all of their needs are met. The environmental pillar is focused more on our resources and making sure that we use everything to its fullest potential and we minimize the amount of waste that we produce. And finally, the economy pillar focuses on our wealth and how that is distributed. It's also focused on making sure our businesses and our countries are profitable. So social sustainability focuses on building communities that are equitable, diverse, connected, and provide a good quality of life. These are the four dimensions of social sustainability. And I'm gonna break those down for you really quickly. Equality is identifying the causes and reasons of disadvantages and finding ways to reduce them. Diversity is finding the needs of different groups of people, assessing those needs and educating everybody to have diverse viewpoints. Quality of life are areas that affect our living such as affordable housing, physical and mental support, and education. And finally, connectedness or social cohesion is increasing participation by individuals within a group. And it's also making sure that everybody in a group has access to public and civic institutions. So social sustainability is important because it leads to higher levels of happiness and well-being among everybody. It leads to less conflict, and it also has a positive impact on the other two pillars of sustainability, namely the economy and the environment. So now I'm gonna shift and talk about culture and sustainability and how they affect each other. So how does sustainability affect culture? By definition, sustainability focuses on meeting the needs of the present, without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their needs. So what this means for different cultures is that they need to be sustainable in order to survive, to preserve their traditions and values. Sustainability also within cultures promote ethical interactions between their environment and resources and equality among the members of their community. Lastly, sustainability brings awareness and praise to the teachings and practices of the culture's ancestors. Now, how does culture affect sustainability? Well, um, culture makes sustainability a social practice. Given the diverse backgrounds, values, and traditions of different cultures, they provide the world with a moral, ethical, and spiritual vision to arising modern issues. Also, culture allows us to tackle these current issues through distant cultural lenses, making us more empathetic and understanding to other, toward other cultures. Now I'm gonna talk about more specifically sustainability within different countries and cultures. And I'm gonna start off with indigenous cultures. So we know that many indigenous cultures are well known for their healthy and, re and balanced relationship with their environment. Since their communities are built close to nature, they're usually well aware <clears throat> of how to, on how to cohabit in harmony with their environment, which is why they have developed technologies and practices that have been used by many generations for their continu continuation, survival, adaptation, uh, and change of their environment. Um, there's some chats. Okay. Um, and then uh, to these indigenous cultures, we owe many of our current practices and to their knowledge. And it is only correct of us to give proper credit to their teachings and respect them. Now I'm gonna talk about sustainability within the Mexican culture, and I'm gonna start off with my personal experience. I grew up in Mexico. I was born and raised there, specifically in Leon, Guanajuato. 
And since really early on during my elementary and middle school years, I learned about the pre-Hispanic cultures in Mexico and the importance of their teachings and sustainable ways of living. Another thing was that food waste was not tolerated and we were made well aware that having food was a privilege that many didn't have. And also we were also very aware that the food in my plate was always made with love and care and we needed to cherish that. Cherish that. And also um, I lived in a very minimalistic way as many other people in Mexico and consumerism was really frowned upon. Lastly, I grew up really close to nature, which made me really aware of my surroundings and what nature has given to us and to be able to survive. So I learned to respect and to be conscious about how I take care of nature and my, envir and my environment. Now I'm gonna talk about a little bit more specific sustainable developments Mexico has recently adopted to be just more sustainable. And I have four different states that I'm going to talk about in Mexico City. Um, so it's Mexico City, Oaxaca, Durango, and Michoacán. I'm going to start off with Mexico City. So this city was built in a lake and by the pre-Hispanic cultures. Of, I think it was Teotihuacan. And this city was built in a lake and all these uh, different pre-Hispanic cultures that developed within the region utilized the lakes to uh, survive and, what, and they invented the system of chinampas, which is an agricultural technology that it basically consists in floating beds of soil where they grow crops and it's tech, uh, considered one of the most sustainable ways of growing crops. Mexico City, there's not many lakes anymore, but the ones that they remain, they still use these systems. The next one is Oaxaca. Um, you can see in this picture that this is a heavily exploited land, and this is La Sierra Norte in Oaxaca. And after being heavily exploited by the private sector, what the state of Oaxaca did was return the land to the indigenous cultures that live in this region for them to manage. The next one is Durango. In Durango, the first bioenergy plant in the country was built and it solely operates with resources provided by the forest in the region and is the biggest one in Mexico. And lastly, in Michoacán, um, the largest system of rainwater collection in Latin America was built in a crater in the Cucundicata mountain and it provides water to nearby regions. So I'm going to share a little bit of my personal experience as well and give three examples of sustainable practices in Asia. And so my parents were born and raised in the Philippines. And so every summer when I was a kid, we would go there to visit family. And something I noticed was you were only allowed to drive certain cars on certain days. And so for example, if your car's license plate ended in a one or a two, you could not drive that car on Mondays. And the main goal of that was to reduce traffic, but we can also see has, how this has positive environmental impacts by reducing carbon dioxide emissions. The second example is Motenai culture in Japan. Now Motenai is a feeling of regret that something is not being used to its full potential or value. So for example, if you have a t-shirt that has a small hole in it and you decide to throw that away, you would call that Motenai because you could have fixed that shirt or you could have reused it for something else. And so this is just a reflection of Japan trying to minimize their waste. And the final example is the Kabuchi Desert in China. And that is the picture that you're going to see here in a second. Um, the, the story behind this is many years ago, this land was used for herding and grazing, but the land wasn't taken care of very well. And so it became the sixth largest desert in China. So 30 years ago, China started this land restoration project where they found ways to plant trees in the sand dunes. And as of 2017, about one third of the land had already been replanted. And so this is good for the environment, but it was also good for people because China also included a poverty alleviation program. So people could sign up to move to this area and plant trees or become farmers. 
um, for a salary. And so these are all just some examples of different sustainability practices within different cultures. And we can imagine if you have a very diverse community that all these ideas will blend and you'll have even more innovative and a more sustainable community. However, we have cultural appropriation, which hinders that. So what is cultural appropriation? Cultural appropriation is the use of objects or elements of a non-dominant culture in a way that doesn't respect their original meaning. It doesn't give credit to their source or it reinforces stereotypes or contributes to oppression. So for example, there is a, Chinese, a traditional Chinese dress called the Qi Pao, and you might have seen people wearing it to like prom or on social media. Um, and the problem with that is a lot of American companies have started to share to sell that and other cultural clothing in other countries um, for profit without understanding their historical significance or the culture that they come from. And so it not only disrespects their culture, but it also takes away from, for example, Chinese companies who make their living off of selling these dresses. And so appropriation affects sustainability because it shows a lack of respect for people and their cultures. And it also hinders equality, diversity, connectedness, and quality of life. And so there was that example of companies profiting off of other countries' cultures. And it also, like cultural appropriation also just is a reflection of prejudices and stereotypes in people's minds. And so here's one of the code words for um, the giveaways and the code word is appropriation on the screen. We'll give you all a second to note that down. Okay, and then we have a quick activity. Um, we're going to show you three pictures on the screen and we're going to give you a poll and you're going to indicate whether that's cultural appropriation or not. And so this is the first, um, first picture. Okay, and there's the poll. And so this is the Kansas City Chiefs and we can see their fans wearing face paint and American Indian headdresses. This is cultural appropriation. I'll give y'all like five more seconds. Okay. And I think y'all can see the poll results, but yes, this is cultural appropriation. And the reason for that is um, first off in wearing the makeup and the headdresses, they're not fully understanding um, where this comes from or the significance of this in American Indian culture. The second reason that this is cultural appropriation is the paint and the headdresses that is like a stare that's a reflection of a stereotypical view of what we have of American Indians because American Indians today you don't see them wearing this that often and so it just reflects the stereotypes and prejudice we have against them as noble savages and lastly this is cultural appropriation because Indians were not included in the decision making process for the Kansas City Chiefs and so they're also not receiving compensation okay our next picture, it's these. Uh, there's a bunch of celebrities here that have their own tequila name brand. And we want to know if you think that this is cultural appropriation. Ooh. Okay. I'll wait a little longer. You're thinking. <clears throat> okay, so we have more no's than yes. Oh, it's a tie. Okay. <laughs> okay, it's a tie. Well, surprisingly, it is cultural appropriation because, let me share. Okay, tequila is a traditional drink made in Mexico by Mexican artisans specifically in the region of Jalisco. 
And it is really disheartening and disrespectful because their main purpose is not to teach about Mexican culture or praise these Mexican artisans that take years and years to create these, uh, this drink, but their purpose is to make a profit out of it. And they don't, we don't really know if they even pay their artisans well enough, their workers, we don't see them giving proper credit to the culture. Um, so yeah, it is cultural appropriation. And it also hurts small Mexican businesses that live off of this. Like Nikki was uh, talking about the chipao. Um, it's the same thing with, with te tequila. Like it's a Mexican thing that Mexicans uh, live off and we should, uh, everyone should respect that. All right, and this is the third and last poll we're going to do. You can see Nick Jonas here with his wife, Priyanka Chopra, at their wedding in India. And Nick and his family <clears throat> are wearing culture, um, traditional Indian dress. And so this is cultural appropriation. I'll give y'all a couple more seconds. Okay. And yeah, the majority said no, and y'all are correct. This is not cultural appropriation. And the reason for that is first, Nick Jonas and his family learned from Priyanka and her family the culture. And so they understood it before they participated in it. And the second reason is Nick is honoring the request of Priyanka and her family in dressing this way while they're at their wedding in India. And so this is not cultural appropriation. This is actually cultural appreciation, which Katya will now talk about. So how Nikki was saying, cultural appropriation is whenever we respectfully borrow elements from other cultures with the intent of sharing ideas and diversifying oneself. Also, this results in a merge, natural merge and blend of cultures in a more inclusive and innovative society. And it brings, uh, like Nikki was saying, how social sustainability and how I was mentioning culture, it brings it all together and we, cre we can come up with uh, better ideas on how to tackle different issues um, in today's world. And what we have learned throughout this presentation has, um, it's that culture is a very important aspect of sustainability. And it's really important for us to reach social sustainability to have this into in, account. Um, social sustainability creates a society that meets everyone's needs and reaches its fullest potential. And if we reach the, uh, well, this potential of the three pillars that Nikki talked about, we can create a social sustainable society. And cultural appropriation and being close-minded hinders sustainability, but if we acknowledge and, and appreciate the different cultures, we can overcome co <clears throat> cultural appropriation. And lastly, uh, this Virtual Earth Month theme was the Sustainable Development Goals Posed by the UN. There are 17 goals that if we reach them all, we would uh, have reached a sustainable society. And we think that throughout this presentation, we touched upon uh, five different ones. Uh, it's gonna be quality education, reduced inequalities, sustainable cities and communities, responsible consumption and production, and partnership for the goals. And that is all for our presentation and we have here our sources for more information or if you have any questions if you have if you want to learn a little bit more uh, just let us know and we'll just go up or down <laughs> and that's all and now i'm gonna open the floor for any questions that y'all might have all right great thank you so much um 
Nikki and Katia. That was very interesting. I definitely learned a lot myself. Uh, we do have a few questions, or at least one question in the chat so far and a comment. Um, so uh, just before I ask those, um, I just want to quickly uh, share my screen here um, with just some what we have coming up next, just in case people need to jump off here. I just want to let you know that the next thing that we have um, on our schedule is on, well, actually, I'm sorry, this is, this is, I think I, you know what, that's my fault. I put the wrong thing there. Um, on Monday, we have, um, I put the wrong icon there. My apologies. So on Monday, we actually have uh, something on at 11 a.m. It's going to be about fair trade, and it's going to be the University Dining is going to be teaching us about fair trade on Monday at 11 a.m. Um, and I also want to let you all know, uh, Katia and Nikki are interns here in the Office of Sustainability. We have an internship program that you can apply to. Applications are currently open, and they close on Monday at 5 p.m., so please get those applications in. All right, so with that, I'm going to go right back to our discussion, and um, which y'all are really here for. So uh, the first comment is that someone just wanted to talk a little bit more about tequila, and they would like to add that tequila takes years of crafting, and in many cases, the companies do not understand the profit, and they abuse the materials to maximize profit. So for example, the new Kylie Jenner bottle. So if you want a little more context on that, I thought that was a, a good point that they had made. And then now we actually ha here have a question. Uh, when viewing pictures of people wearing clothing of another culture, how would you determine if they're respecting it or not? Is it a personal opinion? Or would you have to ask the people if they're aware of the cultural significance of the clothing? I can take this. And so, that, yeah, that's a really good question. Um, and it's definitely hard to tell just from a picture if they are respecting a culture or not and how much that they understand it. So yes, definitely talking to them. I think also just um, looking at the setting, um, what kind of an event is this? Are they including people of that culture or is it just like, or are they not? Um, is how we can tell. And so, yeah, definitely something you need to talk to them about, I guess, and see how they're using it. Did you want to add anything to that, Kathia? I can add a little bit to it. Yeah, I think I agree with Nikki. Like, we can't really go and ask Nick Jonas what was going on through their heads and, like, if they respect it or not. But just from looking at it, and, I mean, this wedding was pretty mainstream. So we know how there was a wedding in India and then there was a wedding here in the U.S. Um, so, yeah, I guess we cannot um, make the assumption just by the picture, but just from what we can see. Yeah, and I think for that particular, <laughs> in particular, it was kind of the context of what was going on, you know, uh, why they were wearing the clothing, what they were trying to do, um, you know, and the fact that the uh, uh, her family asked, um, you know, the Jonas family to wear that clothing and honor that tradition. So that would be an example of appreciation. Um, in terms of just seeing someone wearing a random piece of clothing from another culture, I think that's obviously much harder to understand if they're appreciating or appropriating that culture. Um, I think sometimes it can come down to, you know, that person and kind of, you know, who they are, what they believe. Um, so for example, you know, um, in, in the United States, there's a lot of appropriation um, of black culture. Um, or for example, you have a lot of uh, fans that go and watch uh, sporting events and they love cheering for black people at their sporting events. Um, but then they may not actually care about, you know, black lives matter or, the injustice that's being faced um, by the people in, the people in this country. So that would really be an example of appropriation, not appreciation. You know, you're you're appropriating um, the cultural elements, but you don't actually care about the livelihoods of, of those people that you're appropriating. So that's I think another way that you could kind of think about the idea of cultural appreciation or appropriation. But obviously it's you know it's a fine line. Um, I will have another question here. How do you recommend approaching situations? In, in person where obvious cultural appropriation is happening or online too. I can start. Um, and so if we see cultural appropriation, I think just like from my experience and perspective, definitely talking to them about it. Um, I will say it is a little bit easier if you are in that, if you are from that culture, because you, when 
just in general, when confronting people, talking from your own experience, how it's making you feel, how it's affecting you, um, is a much more powerful way to convince them of like, what they're doing is cultural appropriation. Um, but yeah, I think just like sharing with them about how the way, all the ways that what they're doing is affecting people, even if they don't realize it, because that I think is a big reason that we see people using cultural appropriation today is they don't see the effect that it has on other people and other cultures. Kathia, did you want to add anything? Yeah, I definitely agree with Nikki. And just, I think um, if you're with that, uh, if you're being affected by cultural appropriation of your culture, for example, it's way easier to for you to speak up and actually try to teach them what it really means and how it makes you feel. But I guess um, if it's another culture that's being appropriated, you can stand up and and defend them or <clears throat> not defend them, but just um, speak about it and make them aware of what they're doing. It's not correct, <clears throat> but it's definitely hard. And I personally do not like confrontation. So it's coming from a very uh, distant point of view, but. Yeah, and I think sometimes it's just, you know, asking questions or just having that conversation. Um, I think one of the times of the year you're going to see the most cultural appropriation um, that's very visual is Halloween. Um, a lot of the Halloween costumes that people choose to wear can be very um, offensive. So uh, that is something that, you know, you definitely kind of want to think about during Halloween time. Um, so, yeah, but... I think those are all, those are really good questions. And obviously they're not easy answers, but I think awareness and being willing to have conversations can be very helpful. Um, they're asking, do you have any uh, further reading that you could recommend? Yeah, in, oh my, <laughs> in our um, slides, and we can share some of those links here or put them in a doc and share those with you guys. Um, a lot of our research came from peer review articles that we took off of the a and database. Um, so we can share those, some of those articles with you. So this is an interesting call, call question um, in the chat. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Also, Nikki's point about sharing resources. This is going to be recorded on YouTube as well. So you could also uh, get a screen capture there. Um, but sorry, there's another question here. So for celebrities to acquire their tequila brands, many times they invest vast money to acquire land and resources. Would you say that the Mexican capitalists and landowners are involved in the exploitation of their own culture? Yeah, I, I don't have a great answer for that. Yeah, me either. Um, I didn't do much research about Mexican landowners at all. Um, but what I can say is that it definitely had something to do with landowners in Mexico because they're allowing these uh, celebrities to just acquire the land in Mexico. So yeah, it probably relates to it, but I cannot talk much on it because I don't have that information or knowledge. Yeah, interesting question, though, definitely. Um, so I, I, someone else has said, great job. This was a great presentation. They have to go on um, lots of different comments about um, that they learned a lot and wonderful job with your presentation. Um, so with that, I think uh, that, that, well, I guess I could also just ask another question. Is there anything, you know, like that you, that from your research that you would maybe want to talk more about or just any topics that you cover that you wanted to say more, more about? Yeah, I can go first. Um, yeah, I think... So I wanted to talk about a, a picture that I added in my, one of my slides. I don't know if you remember it. I can share it again, but it was uh, whenever I was talking about my personal experience in Mexico and the different pre-Hispanic cultures that I learned about. Um, there was a picture of these dancers and they're called just viejitos, which means old people. Um, and I wanted to talk about that because I thought it was really interesting that this culture um, many years ago before the Spanish, Spanish conquest of Mexico, they had this traditional dance called, um, I don't remember exactly the name, but they just danced to the, to their gods. 
And it was just a very traditional and important dance for them. And then after the conquest, the Spaniards banned this dance um, because it was just, I mean, they, the whole um, religion issue that they, they just uh, took their gods, uh, they made them believe that they were not their gods anymore and all these, uh, after this whole thing they, that they prohibited this dance, this same culture retook their dance and created it into a Danza de los Viejitos, that it's uh, like a dance of old people. And they mocked Spaniards by dancing it. And I thought it was really interesting. It's not, it was not very related to the, to the culture of appropriation and appreciation, um, but I thought it was really interesting and, and yeah. Yeah, that's a very interesting story. And, um, you know, kind of something you said was talking about this dance and kind of a really cool aspect of culture. And um, at the same time you were sharing that story, someone else commented that unfortunately Mexico does, does go through many cases of cor corruption, but you have to keep in mind what makes Mexico beautiful is not the government or its capitalism, but the people and culture. So avoiding the corruption is important. So I just thought that was a, a nice thought that kind of tied into what, to what you said. Um, Nikki, did you want to try to answer that question at all? Yeah, and so when Katya and I were first brainstorming this, um, one of the, a good part of our research was about like COVID-19 and how different countries and cultures were um, responding to that, especially in regards to solid waste management. Um, and I think it was just really interesting from my big takeaway from that was just seeing how especially governments were um, taking a role in helping shape um, the response of many countries and the sustainable actions that they take. Uh, I guess this kind of ties to cultural appropriation, but just overall, I think a problem that we see in today's society with really anything in general is just being closed-minded to other people who have different beliefs and opinions. Um, and one of those um, peer review articles that we're going to share with you actually talks about how even within sustainability, if somebody has a different approach than you, then that becomes another problem because you both want to be sustainable, but um, you're not willing to be open-minded or work with other people. And so that hinders that. Um, but yeah, I thought that was really interesting seeing how different countries just like within Europe and Asia, especially um, handled that. Excellent. All right. Well, thank you, Nikki. Thank you, Katia. Thanks for everyone for watching. Um, do you all have any concluding thoughts you want to give or do you feel good about where we're at? I think I feel good. Um, yeah. yeah. All right. Great. Well, thank you all so much. That was definitely interesting. I learned a lot. Thanks for everyone's participation in the chat and with the polling questions that made for a more interesting presentation. Um, hope you all have a wonderful weekend. Uh, be safe out there. And we hope to see you back here on Monday. Um, everyone take care. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.